when John agreed to come up here to talk, he didn't want a lecture fee. Instead, he set it up that we got a hundred of his paperback books at wholesale because spreading the word and talking about the incredible things that he talks about in his book was more important than us paying him his fee. So all the proceeds from the books will go back into affordable housing in the Valley. Thanks so much, Linda. It's great to be here. I'm guessing that we're all here for the same reason, that we believe in the preservation of community. Communities are about people. Affordable housing is about people preservation and about the restoration of community. But there are larger problems and opportunities that are affecting communities today and that will become more and more driving forces, I think. In the aftermath of Katrina, it became much easier to sense the approach of the less dramatic but far greater storms of global climate change, peak oil. These issues, I mean, along with global climate change and peak oil, to me, the distribution of wealth is the other essential issue. They're disturbingly complex. They cry out for bold solutions and they're not gonna go away. Mm -hmm. And these are times, I think, that call for outrageous behavior, and that's really the first theme of this talk. I find that as I matured, sort of, you know, um, that I've continued to look for ways to live and work in groups with foundations and with bearings that could endure. And that's the second theme of this talk, is that we really need to have the freedom to give ourselves the freedom and the license to, that would lead to responsible outrageous behavior and invention. There's a choice, and the choice is, are we gonna insist on the future we want, or are we gonna accept the future we get? My business started in the late 60s when we had to keep a roof over our head and building and then design became a passion and we were just doing what we loved. So at a certain point we got tired of losing money on every project we did and I realized I needed to learn about business and business became a new passion. Um, it took a while. Kind of a hinge point in the development of our company came in 85, 86 when some longtime employees who had been with me from the very beginning came to me and said, we don't want to go out and start our own business. We want to make our career here, but we got to have a better stake. We need more than an hourly wage. And so we started to think together about what could we do to formalize what was a very familial, you know, we really collaborated, we worked very closely together, and, um, and it felt like a family. How could we formalize this? My first thought was, let's make them partners. But as we thought together more about it, it occurred to us that if we're really successful, and this is a wonderful place to work, and people want to stay here, then this situation is going to come up over and over again. So why not find a method to have a system that will welcome people in, that will invite people in, that will be a part of the, um, of the culture of the company and a part of the reason people want to come to work there because you are assured that if you stay, you will become an owner of the company. So we then restructured as an employee-owned cooperative corporation. And the amazing thing was I had no clue what the impact of this would be. And that ownership stake changed people's view and changed their commitment and changed their level of responsibility. We were so fortunate to stumble on this mechanism so early because now we have people that are experienced owners and good decision makers. When we restructured, there were roughly two million people in this country working for companies that um, they owned a part of. Today there are 30 million. Now most of these are employee stock ownership plans which don't always include a real voice in how the company is run. Um, but there are many more cooperative corporations than there used to be. And the great thing about this is the people who are making the decisions bear the consequences of those decisions. 
and they truly have the power to set the course of the business. And it makes for tremendous commitment. We all know it, but it's easy to forget in our day-to-day -day work that money as the sole measure of prosperity fails to recognize that people have lives and people have families and people have communities. And many actually do value the quality of their workplace as much as the size of their paycheck and sometimes a lot more. We practice our craft, we run our business, we base our decisions mostly on values, peripherally on profit. Profit is a tool that we use to allow us to be to whatever modest degree a restorative force. The outrageous part is the principles on which the business runs. It's shared ownership, workplace democracy, limited growth, commitment to place, and long-term thinking. Now, those things shouldn't be outrageous, um, but they are for now. And I'm finding, however, that that may be changing and that they're becoming less so. My fellow owners and I at South Mountain Company have the view that the work that we're doing will continue for generations. So far, we haven't been seduced by this revving up. We don't see the benefits. We don't see how you can speed up the unfolding of good relationships. We don't see how you can speed up good craft. We don't see how you can speed up good design. And we think like the cathedral builders of the Middle Ages thought about their work. Charles Handy, who's a British business philosopher, says, cathedrals inspire. It's not only their grandeur or splendor, but the thought that they often took more than 50 years to build. Those who designed them, those who first worked on them, knew for certain they would never see them finished. They knew only that they were creating something glorious, which would stand for centuries, long after their own names had been forgotten. We may not need any more cathedrals, but we do need cathedral thinkers, people who can think beyond their own lifetimes. Problems take on an entirely different cast with that long-term perspective. Things that seem impossible in two and five year um, terms, when you start to think about them in a 25 or a 50 year time span, suddenly maybe we can solve this problem. Maybe we can actually do something about it. Our company did a co-housing project, 16 houses designed and developed by the group of people that were going to live there and they hired us to facilitate the group development and to design and build. And we were very closely connected with the whole project so um, our company moved onto this property adjacent to it. My wife and I bought a piece of land adjacent to it and through the beginning of the project my wife and I never intended to live there, but we gradually started to wonder, why not? And then our 14-year-old daughter said, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You're putting heart and soul into this wonderful project, and we're going to build a house down the road? This seems a little sketchy. And um, we thought more, and uh, we became, we joined the group, became members, bought a house there, and it has been fabulous to test drive this whole uh, journey.